Hi and welcome. My name is Amy Bryant and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm a psychotherapist at Wild Child Counseling. I also do online work um, at Parenting Beyond Punishment, which is an education and support community um, on Facebook. And I am here today with Kathy Gordon, and she is a single adoptive mom to a teenage boy. And she discovered hand-in-hand -hand parenting as she was struggling with some of his fear-driven aggression. And so Kathy, I have been blessed and honored to work with her a few times over the years to talk about this because it's so important and it's such a real struggle. Um, and so I'm just honored once again to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. It's a delight to be here. It is. It's just mm -hmm. nice to be in community with you again. Yeah. 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 So, um, so we're going to talk about why we lose it as parents. Um, and we're going to talk about what can we do when we lose it. And then that bigger picture of how do we heal these things that make us lose it. Um, so... Kathy, I would love for you to share with us. Why do we lose it? Tell me why I lose it, please. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Um, what I love about the work that I've done is the, you know, I've always kind of had this dual interest in like creativity and also science. So when I um, started learning uh, or, you know, taking classes as a parent, um, I started going into the, the science, the brain science of it and, you know, and what's going on, not only our children's brain development, but just the brain in general and how our emotions work. And um, so it, it was, you know, there's a lot of um, great work out there about, you know, what's happening in the moment and how to interact with a child or a spouse or a coworker in the moment. And, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of great uh, communication styles and listening styles. Um, but what I discovered when I started really um, learning about how the brain works and how particularly how our emotions are stored and memories are stored is that when when we get upset in the moment, it's not, it's never just what's happening in the moment. The way that w w our experiences are stored, particularly as a very young child in the first couple of years of life, um, that, that, you know, the, those experiences go into our, our um, the limbic system of our brain, uh, our, our nervous system, and they're sort of like experience and also like the emotion and the physical sensations, right? So when we get upset in the moment, it's not just what's happening in this current moment. It's not just my child's behavior. It's, all, it's, it's actually re-stimulating old, these old feelings of powerlessness, of, um, uh, of hurt, of not be not feeling worthy and you know over and over again like as a parent so much of our struggle is not taking our child's behavior personally you know so the way we can do that is when we get this information about why why i'm taking it personally that it's not again it's not what's happening in the moment it's it's that the re-stimulation of all that stuff from the past and I can do a little, let's do a little couple minutes just about the brain. Okay. Um, and this is going to be an oversimplification because the brain's kind of more like different systems and different networks and, you know, but for the purposes of, um, you know, of our conversation, we're just going to talk about the brain from top to bottom um, or bottom to top actually. And we're going to use, uh, we're gonna, we'll credit Dan Siegel, Dr. Dan Siegel with this, um, I don't know if he originated with him, but you know he's the one who's made this popular, this hand model of the brain, right? So from bottom to top, we have this alarm system. You know that's our fight, flight, freeze. We have our limbic system, which is where our memories are stored, and also where we process fear. This is like the part of our brain that lets us know if we're safe or not. And then there's our cortex, particularly our prefrontal cortex. 
and you can see how it like folds right over like how it sits anatomically is that the cortex is kind of on top of this whole limbic system. So when an old un, really unconscious or, or uh, Dr. Siegel calls it implicit memory gets re-stimulated, this is the part of the brain that then starts, you know, sort of driving us. And again, this is the brain, sort of brain that where, where, where we process fear. So what often comes up is a sense of fear, a sense of powerlessness, and it'll often send this message to the alarm center of danger, 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 you know. And, and then because this is what's driving the brain, in that, in that moment of re-stimulation, we have little access to this, to the thinking, reasoning part of our brain. Yeah. So, you know, and, and this is what happens when our kids uh, have tantrums, get upset, you know, start to talk irrationally. We're trying to reason with them and they're just either on the floor or, you know, we're, we're now we're in an, a verbal argument. You know, it's just, you know, it's just this is the part of the brain that's running, running the show. And they have little access to this thinking, reasoning, and even language processing of the part of the brain. Um, uh, and, um, it, you know, so, so the thing that we want to, we'll talk in a, in, as we go on about like how to stop that process from happening of being re-stimulated and, and as, as uh, Siegel talks about flipping our lid, you know, having no access to our cortex. Um, but um, the thing to, to keep in mind is, okay, you know, here's your child who's, uh, 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 you know, operating out of a sense of fear or l lack of connection or, you know, uh, um, their limbic system is running the show and they're kind of, you know, so they're, they don't have access to the thinking part of their brain. And then here's you, the parent, here's us, the parent, like, and we're re-simulated and we're operating from a sense of powerlessness or, you know, so now you've got two people who are kind of in their reptilian part of their brain and nobody's thinking. Right. Or being yeah. appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and the, and, you know, there's a lot of, <clears throat> this is the last thing I'll, I'll say and then we, you can lead me some more, <clears throat> but, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a huge emphasis on um, teaching children self-regulation, right? How does a child self-regulate so that their brain becomes reintegrated? And I think that that's really important in social, out in the world, like in school, you know, but as human beings, our default is actually to co-regulate. Like when we get upset, we are, 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 are often our first impulse is to call a friend. You right. know, we need to vent, right? right? And that friend is gonna, they're, that friend's gonna stay regulated. They're gonna listen to us as we're like, you know, you know, releasing all of this stuff. And, and as in the safety of their listening to us, then our, we get all that stuff up and out. And then we, we use kind of their calm to, uh, to, to, for, to reintegrate our brain, to come back into a place of self-regulation. Right. But, but we do that, <clears throat> our default is to do that through co-regulation. Right. So, you know, you've done lots of other great workshops on like being with your child when they're upset and not banishing them to their room, or, you know, but, you know, and, and the fundamental reason why is that they need us in order to be able to co-regulate. Right. Yeah. And to use that skill in the world, that self-regulation skill in the world, they have to have that experience with a regulated brain. Not every child. Some children are able to get it in ways that other children can't. These are differences, right? It's whether a child is able to start cultivating that at six or seven or 13 or 14, you know? Yeah. yeah. And there's all sorts of things that affects that. I mean, it, you know, anything that we talk about in terms of our regulation also applies to our children because, a, you know, a human brain is a human brain, right? right. And every human, as you're saying, every human brain is different. So <clears throat> just like a child's ability to regulate is going to be affected by 
what's, what's stored here in the limbic system. You know, was there a difficult birth? You know, um, has there, you know, uh, was there early medical intervention? Was there, um, you know, has, have there been a lot of changes? You know, moving, new siblings, um, separation, divorce, um, you know, um, now they're starting preschool. So now there's separation. So, so one's ability to, um, to have, to regulate, to have this integrated brain, to be able to access the thinking part of our brain really depends a lot on what you're carrying in this. What will our nickname for it is the, the, uh, your emotional backpack. Mm-hmm. And, that, and how that's true for our children, that is so much true for us. Right. So, you know, so, um, uh, you know, at Hand in Hand, we say that parenting is an emotional process. Um, and it's really an opportunity for us to, you know, to clear out our emotional backpacks to, yes. um, so, that, so that there's not so much old stuff here that, get, that gets re-stimulated. It's sort of like, you know, if you think of like the, you know, the, I don't know, the cactus or the rose that's got the thorns on it, you know, so you, you, you know, you get snagged on it. Every time you go by that rose bush, you get snagged by those thorns. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, you don't want to take the, the, the thorns off a rose that's necessary for the rose's survival. And the, actually that's a good, that's a, that's a good thought to have because, you know, all of this stuff that we have in our emotional backpack, we, we collected this, we needed this to survive. Yes. And so when we, you know, to, to, to navigate childhood, um, uh, to navigate our family dynamics, to navigate school. And, um, and so, you know, you know, the first thing to do when we lose it is to understand that it's, that you know, it's this, that's these triggers, uh-huh. um, and and that um, you know, and that we can forgive ourselves. We yeah. absolutely can forgive ourselves. We want to then take the next step and say, like, okay, so how do I get rid of these triggers? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I call them sticky places, and it's the you know, it, uh, that implicit memory that is triggered when we become parents. All of a sudden, we realize all these sticky places we didn't know were there. Right. And so all of a sudden we're like, where, yeah. did, what, where did all this come from? I, I, this wasn't here before. It was. It just wasn't being touched in a way that made it come up. Right. And it's such a lovely yeah. way to go, oh, it's a sticky place. It's something that, I, that needs my attention. It's in, it's in that, that emotional backpack I have. It needs my attention. It's such an opportunity yeah. and so many opportunities <laughs> for growth. Yeah. And it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, and I had done, you know, I had a pretty chaotic um, childhood, uh, you know, from the exterior, we were a lovely Catholic family, you know, um, but in the house, it, my father was a rager and a screamer. And it, so it was really, it, it was, he, he, it was never, no physical abuse, but a lot of <clears throat> screaming and raging and, you know, everything that came out of his mouth had the tone, how could you be so stupid? Right. You know, so, um, so I, you know, I'd done a lot of healing work and then I came to pay- parenthood very late. I was uh, 47 when I adopted my son. And, and one of the things that often happens with parenting is that a lot of those practices that you have to uh, release that stress, uh-huh. um, to stay balanced, can go by the wayside you know it's like <laughs> it's like I, I it, it you know I, I I'll you know in the thick of of really struggling with my son you know we're going through a rough patch and someone will say oh you need more self-care and I just want to bop them in the nose <laughs> you know? it's time. Just like <laughs> self-care like I'd like to be able to take a shower <laughs> right right <laughs> you know You know, so all those things like going to dance class, going to the gym, going to the beach every day, rollerblading down the beach, you know, like all of those things I didn't have the time for anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so then the sticky places are, 
more, they're, they, you know, they're more prominent. They're more easily re-stimulated because yes. the, my stress level is higher. Right. Because we weren't unloading it. So what, yeah. what do we do in the moment then when we lose it? Yeah. So, so great question. Cause I think there's two things to talk about. One is like what to do in the moment right. and then what to do. And, and then like how to heal those sticky places or those mm-hmm. triggers. So, um, uh, it, it, so one of our favorite, or my, you know, my favorite things to do in the moment, and I actually did this one time in the uh, parking lot of Kohl's. <clears throat> well, not right in the middle of the parking lot, but next to my, my next to my car is to lay down. Mm-hmm. Just to lay down, mm-hmm. like you feel yourself getting tight, getting tense, mm-hmm. you know, and. And it feels like you're in a power struggle with your child. If you lay down, it, it, what, that change in your body, it can actually help release some of the, you know, the stress hormones that are starting to curse through your body, the, that fight flight response. And, um, and, it, and it also just, it also can just change the dynamic with your child. Yeah. Like, so all of a sudden your child's like, what? But why are you on the ground? Yeah. 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 And also, if you're having those big emotions, when you get low, it prevents your child from feeling that fear of that big body. Yeah. You know? Even if we yeah. think we're keeping it in and we're look cool on the outside, their brains are picking it up. Oh yeah. Because that's what yeah. their brain. That's what our brains are meant to do. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I don't know what's the what's the percentage of what they say our communication is like. I don't know, ninety three percent nonverbal or something. It's you know, it's right. up to, it's very huge. big. Seventy three percent. It's huge. You know, let's make up a number. It's like ninety five percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, but it is yeah. like that. Yeah. It's something around there. <laughs> and we all have these radars. And one yeah. of the things that's that's really important to um, you know why it's even important for us that you're doing this work and that and that we do this personal work on ourselves is that is this this fundamental brain truth that human beings are more likely and willing to cooperate when they feel safe and connected yeah. and you know and so when we're re-stimulated and we're in that we're in our own you know we can't connect with our child when that stuff is running us we can't connect so it, 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 so, you know, it, it really is going south if you're trying to get them to cooperate and you're starting to feel ramped up. So the first thing that you can do is, is lay down. Yeah. yeah. The, um, you know, the other, some other things you can do. Um, one of the things that uh, we've got to get this great article on the hand in hand website called um, uh, uh, crazy mad five things to do when you, you know, when you start to oh. lose it. Yeah. And, and one of the things to do is to have a plan. Um, uh, it, it, this goes, you know, this is before in the moment, but if you have this plan uh-huh. where, you know, you've like we, you know, your kids go to school, they do fire drills, right? Maybe yeah. even in your house, you have a fire drill. Maybe you have a, you know, here in California, we're all supposed to have an earthquake plan, you know? Right. Um, so we uh, have an anger plan. Right. So yes, yeah. you have an anger plan. I think that plan, makes sense, yes. You know, which is that, you know, that you've, um, you've, and if this is actually how you've empowered your child. So you, you tell your, you know, you, you tell your child that, you know, when mommy gets angry, when daddy gets angry, I'm going to go in the bedroom and I'm going to pound on the bed and you do a rehearsal, but you do it like very comically so that they, 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 there's a lot of laughter, you know, so they've actually sort of kind of like preloaded the idea that it's going to be okay right you know, even though you yes. are going to be really in a state of you know huge anger or um uh, fight flight you know because you've rehearsed it and you've rehearsed it playfully and you know and it's like this is what mommy's gonna do i'm gonna go bam 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 <laughs> you know you know and and then other parts of it are like you put a list uh, uh, on your if your children are old enough to use the phone you know there's a list of your friends that are on speed dial so that when mommy really starts to lose it, you know, 
um, your child knows to go call Susie, your best friend Susie, and hand you the phone and say, hey, mommy wants to talk to you and hand you the phone. You know, you have, you have cards made that says, you know, mommy, I love you. And so your child, you rehearse again playfully that when mommy gets angry here go get the cards you know and mommy you pull up the cards now you know like you know in the that's completely going to diffuse the power struggle if your kid grabs a card that says mommy i love you you know yeah so um um you know you have a plan to put on dance music mm-hmm. the um it, 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 it as human beings we offload tension in five different ways through laughter tears trembling sweating yawning the trembling sweating yawning are when we're releasing like deeper fears but laughter is a great release of tension and it can seem counterintuitive in that moment when you just need your child to put their socks on so you can get out of the house because you're going to be late to school again you know, it can seem counterintuitive to in that moment become playful. Put on the dance music, put on the sock dancing music. Okay, we're gonna put on our, you know, we're gonna, and, but that laughter, that release of tension, you know, then it just helps your brain to reintegrate. Now you're back in that thinking place. And these are all things that you've planned for. These are things you've rehearsed. Um, we have a, a, a strategy or um, um, it's one of, it's part of our play listening tool called the vigorous snuggle. That when your child is off track, that you, you know, and they're, you know, they're being cranky or bossy, you know, you come in and you snuggle, snuggle, oh, I gotta get all those crabbies out of you. Where, is there a crabby in your nose? Is there a, you know, where, there are some crabbies between your toes? Mm-hmm. And you get that laughter going that releases the tension and, and diffuses the power struggle. And what I tell parents is, practice the vigorous snuggle when it's good, yeah. when everything's fine. Because you won't, in that moment of tension, when you're both like this, both of your, you know, limbic systems are running the show, you know, you won't remember. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's just a habit that to snuggle your kid. So. My daughter loves the vigorous snuggle. It gets us through lots and lots of difficult times. And it, it does a lot. It builds that connection. It has sensory input to get her back into her body and to get me back into my body so I'm not stuck up here like this. Um, yeah. I love the vigorous snuggle. We use it for everything. Sadness, anxiety, fear, anger, digging in. Oh man, it's good for digging in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whether it's me digging in or my kid, right? Yeah. So. yeah. 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 So those are all things you can do in the moment. Uh-huh. Um, you know, there's some other sensory things you can do. Like you can go and splash water on your face. Uh-huh. You can say, you know, oh, mommy needs a timeout. Uh-huh. You know, um, uh, you know, the, the great thing about laying down is that you don't even have to think about it. Like you yeah. just collapse just on the floor. It. You know, some of the other things require that we've still got enough connection to our higher reasoning center to actually make a choice. Yeah. But that laying down, you can just go. Poof, you, you just know. do it. Yeah. Well, it. What I like about the laying down or sitting down or any sort of moving down motion is it, it sends a signal to our brain that we're safe. Because if a bear is chasing us, we are not going to lay down. We're going to be like, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. So it literally sends a signal to our brain that we're safe because otherwise we would be running like crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, my my mother's way of coping with my father's um, anger and his, you know, criticism, you know, is that she would often just get in the car and leave. She'd just mm-hmm. go to the store. Right, you know. right. <laughs> Drive, drive from Illinois to the East Coast to see your sisters. You know, I mean, she oh my just, gosh, yeah, so, yeah. So that, I mean, that, that's not. I'm being a little facetious, <laughs> but you know, like that was like she, you know, she needed to escape his, you know, and so, and and so like that. So that was modeled for me. Yeah. So that like fleeing mm-hmm. is a it is a real knee jerk reaction for me yes. when you know. So that's why, you know, the laying down, that's why I say like, you know, my son and I, he's, you know, I, I, I don't know, he, he, whether we were arguing or he had dug in, I think he dug his heels in about something, you know, and I was starting to get, I could feel myself starting to get frustrated. So I just yeah. laid down on the pavement in front of my car. Oh my gosh, I called. <laughs> so great. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, there's just something about it that works. I, I had a similar situation in a grocery store. My daughter was, uh, I don't know, four or five, and she got just was so upset about something, and I was having a hard time. I don't know. We were both on the struggle bus, and I, could, I couldn't think of anything to do. I just We sat down in the grocery store aisle and cried together. I just held her, and we cried, and I was like, this is what we're doing, <laughs> you yeah. know? But there's something about joining in, too, that regulates us and that allows us to step into compassion instead of criticism and fear and overwhelm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, our, our knee jerk as uh, human beings is to co-regulate. Yes. That's our, that's our default. Yeah. So that's we what have hard wire to do. Yeah. Right. So um, we had a, question slash comment. Um, Sheena says, um, it can be so hard not to take it personally when my teen makes it personal. I lost it and she said, I won't forgive you in her teen rigidity. She expects perfection from me. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sheena, because um, I have a teen too. <laughs> yes. She's 14 now. And um, yeah. And you know, all children, but particularly teens, you know, they, they know where to, you know, they know right where to poke. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, all children do, but especially as our children get more verbal and more aware of us and our own struggles, they know right where to poke. Um, and um, so... Where to, where to start with this? Um, because where you want to, where we want to be, where we want to try to be in that moment is to see, like, there's one, there's a mantra that I use. And, oh, mantras are really good, too. I, yes. I, I forgot to mention that, but mantras are really good. Like, I have one, like, I feel myself start to get tight, and I'll say, soft. Uh, and just saying that, soft. It, I, it, you know, but, um, but the mantra I, I uh, often use uh, in the moment with my teen is he does not want to be like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He does not want to be like this. So even though he's coming at me verbally, you know, uh, uh, or he's dug, really dug his heels in against some, about something, I, when I say that, that helps me to not take it personally and just soften a little bit. And, um, and it also helps me to see the pain and the fear that is driving the behavior. You know, one of the things that's so difficult about parenting teens is that, you know, when there is fear and pain driving a three-year-old's behavior, they might try to hit you, they might throw their blocks, they might just, you know, collapse on the floor and kicking and screaming. But when you're when when uh, uh you know the when the pain and the um fear is driving a teenager all of that comes out verbally mm -hmm. and you know and the way that their their brain is functioning is that it, you know this is not my fault i don't want this pain this is not my fault it must be your fault mm -hmm. you no know? So the, it, it's the way our, our founder, Patty Whiffler, talks about it. Whenever there's fear and pain that's driving um, a, aggression or, you know, even verbal lashing out, it's like we have to have some place to focus it. We have to have some place to, you know, to send it. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, you know, we're the same is true with, again, that three-year-old who's, you know, uh, so, you know, coming at us, you know, no, 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 no. Like, like there's a, there, they have to have a way, way to focus the fear. And one of the analogies I like to use is I, in my mind, I, I think of a person drowning. So when a person's drowning, you know, not the kind of drowning where they, you know, they say, oh, now you have to have to be careful, like they just go underwater, but the person who's aware that they're drowning right. and they're thrashing, right. you know, and you're trying, you know, you're trying to reach for them, but they're thrashing. They're thrashing. They're in a total panic. They're in a complete and total panic. 
And that's the, the image in my mind that I like to use, you know, when that all of that stuff is being directed at me, that they, that even though it looks like they're, you know, that like, like their, their brain is regulated, then they're, they, they're not, they're actually in a state of panic because fundamentally we know that our child is good. And fundamentally we know that if they were thinking, they would not be saying these things. Right. So that's, that's how I, that's how, what I do in the moment. And then when I talk about like how to heal it so you don't take it personally. Do. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, so hand in hand has a parent to parent support tool called listening partnerships. Um, uh, uh, let me step back and say that, you know, there's lots of ways to heal. Well, let me step back even farther back to go back to what I said in the very beginning, that in that moment when our child is spewing that stuff at, at us and, and the reality is that it's coming from a place of pain and they, if they were thinking they would not, be, they would not be saying those things. That's not who they are. And so um, what's preventing us from having that thought and reaching for them is our own childhood hurts, disappointments, dings, dents, you know, any trauma, trauma with a big T, trauma with a little T, um, uh, you know, any feelings of powerlessness, that all of that is being re-stimulated. So I'm going to share our hand-in-hand -hand tool called Listening Partnerships and acknowledge that there's lots of ways to heal those old hurts, those old disappointments. Um, uh, I've probably done a majority of them um, <laughs> through the years, you know, coming from such a chaotic um, childhood and uh, with a lot of fear in, in our home. Um, so I've probably done a lot of them. And uh, personally, I have found listening partnerships to be the most powerful tool to heal those old hurts. Um, now, you know, we, we have other parent to child tools that are about setting limits around behavior. And so I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, oh, you know, you want to get to a place where you could be a punching bag for your child. I'm not saying that at all, you know, but, but I'm saying that, you know, when we're re-stimulated, we won't be able to think well enough to use any other tools. We won't be able to think well enough to bring a limit or to become playful. We won't be able to think well enough to, you know, to, to, to be able to help them right. get back to that. We, you know, to, to get back to that regulated thinking place. Right. So, so I, so I want to make that point that, you know, this is not about like permissive parenting, like, Oh, I'm just going to be okay with whatever my child can, right. you know. Well, it's not, about having yeah. fewer sticky places and a lighter backpack. Exactly. Exactly. So that I can think well in the moment. Right. So that I can think well about, Oh, I think I want to bring a limit around this. Or, Oh, right. I think I want to be playful. I want to bring a playful limit around this. So, yeah. you know, um, uh, or, or, you know, I'm just going to listen because I understand that that's, they're just, they just need to puke, you yeah. know, and just like, just like, you know, when our child gets a virus and we know that what their body needs to do is puke, so we can see that, you know, there's, there's all that emotional stuff in their backpack is like a virus and they may need to have an emotional puke. Yeah. And so if I listen, you know, with just with empathy and my warm presence, um, um, actually this is a good, cause this is, this is actually the crux of listening partnerships. It is. So, so if I'm listening to them as yeah. they're spewing all this stuff out of their emotional backpack, and I'm holding the thought, you're good, I'm sorry it's hard, you're gonna figure this out. I'm just holding that thought, and maybe I'm murmuring some empathy. This is our, this is our tool of stay listening. Yeah. Um, the, then what happens is that in that space, in that balance of attention between their puking and me holding, like anchoring them in my love, 
that they get to get that stuff out, their backpack is lighter and this can happen where they're reintegrated, mm-hmm. right? So that's, that's actually, you know, we need that too. We also yes. need that. We, because we're carrying around our back, uh, stuff in our backpacks. So, um, so listening partnerships is a parent to parent or adult to adult exchange of listening time where um, you set a timer and the fundamental guideline is that, um, that, that while I'm puking all this stuff from my emotional backpack, my partner is here and they are going to listen with the, um, there, there, there's no advice, there's no referring, there's no reflecting, reflecting back. So it's not active lesson, listening at all. It's not the kind of like where, oh, I heard you just say. It's, it's not that at all. Right. Because the person's actually, in a way, they're not even talking to you. They're talking into the space. They're, right. they're dumping into the space. And you're anchoring them in the truth, which is that they are good, that they that um, that that um, all of these old hurts and messages, old messages, is not who they are. They were things that happened to them. And and so so it's like what happens is, and um, uh, I I now do the almost all of my listening partnerships via phone or Skype, you know. Uh, or Zoom, um, but uh, they started originally when Patty first started Hand in Hand as the idea, you know, it was this little organization in Palo Alto. We're now a huge international organization. And, um, and so it started really being in person. Mm-hmm. So the idea was, um, or the, the, the mechanism, the healing mechanism was like, so, you know, like I'm here and I'm, you know, you know, I start out talking about, you know, something that my son said to me or how hard it is, you know, and then like just following in my part, all my partner's doing is they're just maybe murmuring empathy. Like, you know, I'm right here. Yeah. In person, they don't have to say anything because, you know, I look up and I see, I see them. I see the truth in their eyes. right? Right. But on the phone, you know, you know, a little bit of murmuring so that they know that, you know, the phone line hasn't gone dead. Right. <laughs> right. Just enough. I, I know, I know that they're still there. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, really hard time with my son and just a sense of despair. And, you know, and all of a sudden my father's, I, I tend to think in pictures, especially mm-hmm. when I'm thinking stream of consciousness. So then all of a sudden, you know, my father's face pops in my mind and something he said to me, some horrible thing he said to me, you know, and I'm crying hard about that. And so then I'm like, so now I'm going to fight for my life. And now I'm going to like, tell him like, you, you're like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. how dare you say those, you know, so, so right. things I couldn't say to him. Right. Cause know, it wasn't what, safe when you were right. It wasn't safe yeah. to say those things. So I'm going to fight for my life and maybe I'm going to push against the wall. I'm going to, if I'm in person, I'm going to push against my partner. I'm going to push, 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 you know, and I'm going to like get all that stuff out and really fight for myself and say those things I couldn't say. And every time I look up, I see the truth in her eyes or his eyes. I see the truth. I see the truth, which is that I am good, okay. that I am strong. I'm starting to get a little conflict here, you know, <laughs> that I am worthy, yeah. that I am smart. You know, all those things that my dad said to me about how I was, you know, had poor judgment. and You know, are she, a good mom yeah, and you have yeah, worked hard. Yeah, yeah. He still all says those things, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, you know, but I'll tell you, here's the really beautiful thing about listening partnerships and me like working on that stuff with my dad. Yeah. <clears throat> that I finally got to the place. It's not that it doesn't hurt when he says something like, you know, you, you, you know, you have poor judgment. You never should have bought a house, whatever, whatever he says, you know, right. you know, like, haven't you figured out that you're not going to be successful as an actress by now? You, you know, like those, like he's like, I finally figured out, like I had this like light bulb moment of like, Oh, he says those things to me. Like somebody else says, Oh, you're wearing a green shirt. Right. Like, like there's something from his own childhood, there's something missing in the 
<laughs> appropriate things to say department. Right. <clears throat> you know, anyway, so, so by working on that, those old messages that, you know, and, and, and the healing again happens in the balance of attention. It happens in, you know, I'm spewing, I'm spewing, I'm spewing, I'm all, you know, all over the place. My partner's like here, just like really just holding, anchoring me in the truth. You know, they might say a few words to counter my feelings like, you're a good mom. Right. You are so smart. But they're not giving me advice. They're not, you know, they're not saying like, they're not even saying, again, we're not, they're not even reflecting back. Like, oh, what I hear you say is, you know. Right. Because again, I'm not really talking to them. I'm talking into the space. And they're anchoring me in the truth. And it's in that balance of attention. I put my attention on the old stuff from the past. I puke it up, you know, I get it out. And then I look up or I, I, I sense her presence when we're on the phone. And, I, I, and then I feel the truth. So it's in that balance of attention that the healing happens. And literally, like, you know, it's like you're chipping away. You're chipping away. You're chipping away. And, and then, like it's, it's almost gone. Like I say, it's not in the moment when my father says those things to me, it's not like I can just laugh it off. You know, I have to go right. get more listening time around it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it hurts. Yeah. 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 But I do find that it's less re-stimulating when my son says things to me. Right. You know, I don't get immediately catapulted back into that feeling of being that child who was powerless in the face yeah. of my father's rage right no so i can stay integrated my brain integrated i can stay thinking i can stay connected to my heart i can stay warm i can you know as i say i can either simply listen to his feelings or i can bring a limit or you know i can bring a limit like oh sweetie you know, I mean, I generally don't bring a limit if he's spewing that stuff at me in a, right. like an emotional release. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, you know, if he's saying it, he doesn't have any siblings, but let's say he was saying it to another child, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've had 14, 13, 10, you know, when my son was, I guess about nine or 10, I started driving his friends to the skate parks, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I'd have kids that ranged, boys that ranged from like 10 to 14 in my car, and they would start sniping at each other. And I'd pull over the side of the road and crawl in the back and start snuggling them. You know, yeah. It soon happened that they didn't snipe at each other very much. All I'd have to say is like, oh, do you guys need a snuggle? <laughs> That's so, so Yeah. So, you know, it was a way of playfully bringing a limit around the the stuff that they were spewing at each other. They're like, shh, she's gonna snuggle us. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. She's pulling yeah. over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you can't. You know, you know this idea of like, well, you know, how you teach empathy. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't teach empathy unless you're. First of all, you can model empathy, right. and you can't teach empathy when they are operating from that place of of hurt, pain, disconnection, you know, fear. Right. So. And we can't do, we can't teach them or model it when we're in that place either. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would be like if we all had the memory of don't make me pull this car over and the threat was a hug versus what the threat was for us? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> That's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it and it's really so much about the you know the more we work on our own healing, the we change the culture in our family. We have a we we have a, a teleseminar on our website called um, "When Children Lash Out Replay," and there's an instructor candidate on there, uh, Summer Sheldon, who um, really made this commitment to any time her boys were aggressive that she would she would reach for them with affection. She would bring a limit with affection, like the vigorous snuggle, a thousand kisses. And she talks in there about how she had to get listening time around how, um, uh, how her brother physically hurt her, mm. you know, cause it was so re-stimulating when one of her yeah. boys would hit the other 
was so re-stimulating that she just, you know, she would just grab them and like, don't you dare, you know, like, and, and want to hurt the one who had hurt the brother. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, be, because she's, you know, gone through our program and she understands how the brain works and re-stimulation. She was like, oh, there's something going on here. So she got lots of listening time around how her brother hurt her and cried hard about it and, you know, got to fight back in her mind's eye. And then she made this commitment that she was going to greet, she was going to, anytime her boys got aggressive with each other, she was going to come in with affection. Oh no, little boys who hurt, you know, little boys who hit, get a thousand kisses. <laughs> because, because the, and, and I'll just step back for a second to explain for anybody who thinks like that's counterintuitive, like why would you, mm-hmm. why, you know, like why would you, like are you rewarding bad behavior is to understand that it's fear and disconnection that's driving the aggression. Right. So when you come in and you bring a limit playfully and you bring a limit with affection, you are addressing the fear. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, the laughter is the release of fear. Right. So mm-hmm. what, but the point of the story is that what happened in the culture of her family mm-hmm. is that when one of the, bro- the, particularly the brother who really struggled with lashing out, when he would start to get upset, the other brother would be like, mom, you know, Joey needs a thousand kisses. So, you know, your example of like the, a childhood memory of, you know, you're, you're going to get snuggles when the car pulled over. Like think of like if your childhood memories are like instead of your sibling tattling on you yeah. in a way of like wanting you to be punished. Yes. Like your sibling is calling for help for they you. need some love. Yeah. Beautiful. And so, and because she greeted aggression, you know, she, you know, met, reached for him with aggression, I mean, with affection, anytime he got scared and lashed out, she's created this culture in her family of, this is how we help each other. We get mom to come and give a thousand kisses, right. or we get mom to come in and playfully bring a limit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, so, you know, when we heal our own stuff, then we can, we, that's how we can change the culture in our family. Yes. Oh, I love that. So, um, how is, so I'm a therapist. We, I do listening stuff in my my therapy room of course but it is different than therapy Mm -hmm. yeah so tell me a little bit about how it's different or let's talk a little bit about how yeah yeah so i mean the first thing and and this is not you know you know i I want an abundant practice for you amy because you're so powerful (laughs) so lucky to be to to be able to work with you um and listening partnerships are free yeah. And they're in the moment. Right. We, you know, we have a, a big hand in hand parent support group and there's several parents on there who have started WhatsApp groups. Yes. So that, oh, that's brilliant. Yes, okay. So that you can, you know, message, hey, anybody got five minutes to listen to me? Oh my gosh, that you know? is brilliant. Yeah. Now now I will say, let me just so there's not a misunderstanding, yes. that texting yes. is not the same as listening partnerships. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because there's there's some help in texting, but oh, it's yeah. not the same healing process. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and even you know even venting is not really the same. You know, yeah. like 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 sometimes people will like we have a um, in the Facebook group we we have a function where people can vent. You know, we yeah. have a, a policy for that. Like you can vent, and we're just going to listen. But it's still yeah. not the same as getting this this. Um, uh, balance of attention with this person who's anchoring you in the truth. Yeah. So, but, so how it's different in, from therapy is that it, it, it you know, it's free. It, it can be in the moment, you know, anytime, you know, because we're, you know, because um, your uh, community and your Facebook group is an international community and the hand in hand Facebook group is an international community, yeah. you know, you know, you're up at midnight, you can't sleep there's somebody on the other side of the world that maybe they just sent their kids off to school and they've got, you know, 20 minutes where you can trade listening time. So, you know, so it, you can, you can get it in the moment. Um, And then the major difference 
is that you're not, your listening partner's job is not to help you, to help you figure out what to do. And that is often part of a therapist's job. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what your ratio would be, but, you know, maybe it's like 90% listening, 10% feedback, right. you know, but, you know, I spent a lot of years in therapy and a big part of her job was helping me to recognize patterns. Like she right. would point out patterns or she would make suggestions as to how I might hold something, you know, right. how I might reframe something. And, and your listening partner does none of that. Yeah. So they all they do is they just anchor you in the truth that you are smart, you're a good parent, you know, what happened to you is not who you are. And you do that as a therapist as well. Um, but it's the one, but, but you know, it, the, the major thing you'll get from it is this, um, uh, it, it, you know, is this space where, nobody's going to make a suggestion or tell you what to do. You're right. just going to get to, you know, and, and in listing time, you may not come up with what to do. Right. You no. Know, right. um, um, you might have light bulb moments. You might not. You might right. just, after you dump, come back, you know, to your family and feel lighter and feel more flexible and more playful and they yeah. may be able to think well, you know? So, so, so those are the major differences. And, you know, I mean, my son and I are both in family therapy, you know, and, um, and, and I'll admit, sometimes I get frustrated. <laughs> yeah. So I said to my, the, my, the, my therapist, we, um, she's lovely. She's lovely. And she's really patient with me. Uh -huh. But I said to her, please don't reframe. Yeah. It makes me crazy when you reframe, like, right. you know, just because I'm, I've got so many years of doing listening time, yeah. you, know, you know, I'm really using her to, um, to, you know, to kind of think well about what to do, particularly in regard to school or, you know, and she's the conduit to my son's therapist. So, but, yeah. but, um, uh, it, it's really more practical matters in there. Whereas, I like when my clients tell me, like, I really actually just want you to listen right now. Yeah. Or sometimes I'll say, are you wanting some feedback or are you really just wanting me to hold this space? Right? Because yeah. that holding space, like you're saying, is so helpful and sometimes so much better than reframing. Yeah. yeah. And it's so powerful. I love that you just tell her. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm glad she can take it. Therapist yeah. should be able to yeah. take it. Yes. She's really good. She's really yeah. good that way. And that, you know, like, like, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that, those are the major differences. Does that answer your question? No, you it totally does. I love it. I, yeah. I think that they're lovely and brilliant. And for, for clients who want to see me for parent education and like really getting into the family stuff, I always recommend getting a listening partner to yeah. do some of the other stuff if they don't want to do that in the room. And some, you know, and sometimes, um, so one question that might come up is like, you know, if I'm going to partner with somebody, what if my stuff is too big for them or their stuff is too big for me, you know? And for the most part, that shouldn't, well, let me back up. So, so if somebody is sharing with you and you're starting to feel uncomfortable your own stuff is being re-stimulated, yes. you know? And so you can do one of two things. You can say to that partner, you know what? Well, well actually, um, before I say that, that it, I think it's really good. Um, I have, oh my gosh, you know, at least a half a dozen listening partners. And then as a hand-in-hand -hand instructor, I have access to almost all the hand-in-hand -hand instructors, you know, so yes. I have a huge network. Um, but, you know, we highly recommend that, you have more than one listening partner. Mm -hmm. You know, often people times people ask me, can you do listening partnerships with your spouse? Yes, you can, but it's also really good. Yes, you can, particularly if you follow the guidelines of, you know, I'm 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 only here to hold the space and just to hold the thought that you're good and you're gonna figure it out. Mm -hmm. But you uh, you might need to bring up things about your spouse that you should have another, it would be good for you to have another listening partner. 
you know? Right, right. So you, you can't vent to your spouse about your spouse, really. No. Or it's, unload. It's, I should call it yeah. unload. It's not vent. Yeah. Very different, yeah. actually. Yeah. And so, and so, um, and oh, here, let me just say this. Here's why venting yeah. is different. Okay. Venting, venting usually keeps you right on the same plane of the current situation. Yeah. You're just complaining and complaining and complaining and pew, you know, spewing about the current situation. Mm -hmm. In listening partnerships, the more you do it, particularly the more safety is created in this partnership, yeah. and the more you allow yourself to think stream of consciousness or you ask yourself like, wow, what's underneath this? Or what's my early me earliest memory of feeling this way? Yes. Then, then, the you know, then you're actually working on – um, accessing those old hurts and those old memories and either laughing about them or crying about them. Or you find, might find yourself sweating or shaking, you know, or um, um, actually <clears throat> what happens with me is that when I access really deep fear, mm -hmm. I actually start to gag. Like, I, you know, oh, like, wow. my yeah. like my body's trying to get it out, you know, yeah. and it's like the really deep fear. Yeah. Um, so that's the difference between listening partnerships and just venting. Venting just keeps you on that, like, okay, I can get a little relief about this as I complain about my child or my spouse. Right. But the healing happens as you allow yourself to access those old implicit memories. They may not even, you may, you may not, you may just access a sensation. Right. You know, Could that's be like, pre-verbal anyway, yes, right? Yeah. Yes, it, you might, you might, as I say, you might find yourself sweating, you might find yourself yawning, you might find yourself, you know, trembling, you know, so, um, and those are like, you're accessing, like the, here's the experience, here's the feelings, the feelings are being released through those physical sensations, you're always going to have that experience, that experience is always going to be there in your memory, but you won't have the feelings that feeling of powerlessness, that feeling yeah. of hurt that's glommed onto it, that is the sticky place. You yes. know, that is the trigger. Mm -hmm. you know, so. I love it. So people listening can find a listening partnership through Hand in Hand Parenting. Yeah. Really awesome. great place is our um, Hand in Hand Parent Support Group. It is a closed group. You do, you can't, you, you do have to, um, I saw you just did this with your group. You yeah. know, you, you can't add your friends. Everyone has to make yes. their own request. Right. There, there are three questions you have to answer mm -hmm. about the ages of your children and your interest in your group. But it is a, it's a group of 80, almost 8,500 people, all of whom who are, um, uh, well, you know, all, all wanting to learn about hand in hand and practicing it to varying degrees, but a lot of listening partnerships happening. Yeah. A lot it's a of, lovely group. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of like anybody available, you know, in the next hour, you know, right. and, um, and as I say, that's where they, <clears throat> several people have started the WhatsApp group where you can text, so you know, to, to get listening partnership. Yes. I love yeah, that. So that's a great place to get listening partnerships. I mean, you can, a question we often get is, you know, can a friend be a listening partner? Absolutely. Here's what I say. Anyone can be your listening partner if they follow the guidelines. And you know what, Amy, maybe we'll, you know, we have an article, I don't remember the exact title because I tend to look for things by tags, but if you put in soothe <clears throat> on our website, there's an article that I wrote that lists the guidelines or, you know, you know, maybe we okay. can put the guidelines up on, you know, um, it's like a bullet, point. it's a bullet point list of like how your session should go, yeah. you know, and, and what, what, how, you know, how it works. And so you can, anybody who will follow the guidelines of not referring, not giving advice, just anchoring you in the truth that you're good, you'll figure it out, can be your listening partner. Yeah. Um, oftentimes with friends, we have such ingrained patterns yeah. of chatting and giving advice and back and forth, you know, that it can be difficult to break that habit for like that set time, like, okay, we're just doing listening time. Yes. <laughs> you can and do to, it. And to not bring it back up. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. I think because that is you, the challenge. Yes. Because here's what, you know, as you're like, as you're spewing your deepest, darkest, old hurts, you, you want to be able to presume safety. You want yeah. to be able to presume 
it's sort of like that thing of, you know, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, you know, yes. you want to presume that anything that you say in that 10 minutes of your time or 15 minutes of your time is never going to be referred to again. Right. Like your partner's not going to come on next week and go, Hey, so how's that thing going with your kid about, you know, right. no, yeah. cause it was shared and we all slip, you know, we right. all slip, but but, um, uh, you know, you, you want to you wanna be able to, you, you, your healing can only happen when you, you are, um, when there is that safety that it's yeah. never going to be referred to again. And things like chatting and things like giving advice, it just erodes the safety. Because yeah. now, how can you trust that your partner is holding this singular thought, you're good, you're going to yeah. figure it out, if they're going to give you advice later. Like, right. like, you know, they've probably been thinking about, and so I'll, I know we're over time, so I'll just share okay. this last thing. So you know how in, in, um, uh, in beginning meditation classes, they often teach this idea that, you know, you're, you're on the, you're at the train station, your thoughts are at the train station, right? You know, you're in the center. And then this train starts to go, this thought train starts to go down the track of like, oh, what am I going to do today? And now oh, I've got, you know, I've got all these, you know, you know, so you bring that train back to the station. You know, right. the reason I, I like to give people this mantra of, you know, you're good. Um, every, everybody you're talking about is good. You're going to figure it out is so that, you know, um, as because I've been doing it for a long time. And as I'm listening, I, my mind will still wander. Of course. You know, it's just a part of what know. our brains do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I bring it back to that, to that thought. You're yeah. good. Everybody, you're, nice. you are so good. You are such a good mom, you know? So, yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, I was going to say one other uh, quick thing about that, but it's gone. Was, it's all right. It's, it might come back to you. Yeah. yeah. But you're yeah. good and you're going to figure it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I want people to know how they can get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you. Cause I know yeah. you teach classes locally in LA and you also do online coaching and classes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So, um, yeah. So the easy way to get in touch with me is Kathy at hand in hand And it's, um, uh, K A T H Y and hand in hand parenting is all one word, lowercase hand in hand parenting.org. Um, that's the easiest way to get in touch with me. You can also, I mean, I co-moderate the Facebook group, Hand in Hand Parent Support. Um, so you can reach me through that group. Um, I'm on the Hand in Hand website. Um, and, um, you know, and I've got a, I teach a six-week online starter class where you learn the basic, the four basic um, Hand in Hand Parent to Child listing tools. And you get regular lists, you get a, you know, so it's a great, like, if you're kind of like, like, oh, I don't know if I can do that, <clears throat> you know, doing a starter class or even, you know, working with me it, it, privately, working with an instructor, you get the experience of being with an ex experienced listener. So you get that bi built in weekly listening time because, um, uh, a big part of that um, starter class is in uh, is is giving you listening time. It is coaching, but it's also listening time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm uh, I have another starter class that's um, uh, the one I'm doing in May is full, but I have one that's starting mid July. Okay. Oh, uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific, and but that all that's on the website. You know, okay. or you can yeah. So, so they can go to handinhandparenting.org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They can find me there. Kathy Gordon, G O R D O N. Um, yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Kathy. Mm -hmm. It's always lovely to chat with you. Thank you, um, thank you parents, for being here. Um, Susie said, thank you, Amy and Kathy. Um, so this was lovely as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>